Okay. Uh, welcome. We're going to get started now. And um, I'm Michael Carroll. I'm the director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property here at the Washington College of Law. We're delighted to welcome counsel and, and counsel for some of the am amicus uh, in the case of the Federal Trade Commission versus Actavis. Uh, the case was originally accepted under the name FTC ver versus Watson. Um, and uh, welcome not only to the audience here in the room, but to our uh, online audience and uh, folks who are going to watch us at a later date. Um, I'm very grateful for all of the counsel who were able to make time to be with us, particularly on this uh, rare snowy day in Washington. Um, and uh, I, I want to introduce our speakers first and then set the case up briefly and then uh, let them get at it. Um, so to my immediate left is Julia York. She's an uh, associate at the law firm of Skadden Arps, Slate, Meager, and Flom. Uh, she's counsel for respondent Actavis, um, and she's an associate in the Washington, D.C. office who concentrates on antitrust and competition law. Uh, she's represented numerous global corporations in various industries, including pharmaceuticals, energy, and financial markets, um, and engages in counseling as well as litigation work. And thank you, Julia. Uh, to her immediate left is Rohit, uh, Rohit Singla from the law firm of Munger, Tolls, and Olson, um, who is counsel for respondent Solvay Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Uh, he's a litigation partner focusing on antitrust and intellectual property issues in high-tech sectors. He's represented clients in a wide range of industries, including software, entertainment, video games, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices. Um, and he has broad experience with claims of monopolization, horizontal and vertical conspiracies, and resale price maintenance, um, and the list goes on. Uh, to his immediate left, is Ryan Christian uh, from the law firm of White and Case, who is counsel for respondent Par Pharmaceutical Companies, Inc. Um, he's an associate in the global white collar and, and commercial litigation practices. Um, his practice focuses on white collar criminal defense, criminal and civil investigations, and complex civil litigation. He represents foreign and domestic uh, corporate entities and individuals in matters involving federal, state, and foreign law enforcement and entities in complex civil litigation, such as a case like this. Uh, to his immediate left is Krista Cox um, from Knowledge Ecology International, who is counsel for Amicus uh, Knowledge Ecology International, um, a, a nonprofit organization based here in Washington uh, and in Geneva, who, who has worked on the issue of access to pharmaceuticals in a variety of fora, and um, this, their work in this case is, is a part of that general work. Um, uh, she is a graduate. Uh, well, I didn't say where everyone went to law school, so I'm not going to do it. Um, to her immediate left is a new entry into our, our speaker. Uh, we're glad to welcome David Sorensen. Um, David, you've got to tell me the name of your law firm because I don't have it. Berger Montague, uh, based in Washington. Uh, Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, sorry. Um, and... and um, who is engaged in, in private antitrust enforcement. So he is um, on the plaintiff's side. You'll notice we don't have anyone from the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice with us. The government has a standing policy not to comment on pending cases, and so uh, we can't have any of anyone from petitioner directly. David is, is aligned with the petitioner's cause in this action. And finally, last uh, but not least, is uh, Professor Scott Hemphill from Columbia Law School. A prof um, in his research, examines the balance between innovation and competition set by antitrust, intellectual property, and other forms of regulation. Uh, from 2011 to 2012, he served as chief of the Antitrust Bureau in the office of the New York State Attorney General. Um, and it, we should say that the state's attorneys general, including the New York office, filed an amicus brief in this case supporting the petitioner. Um, one other disclosure, there was a, um, a brief filed in support of petitioner by 188 professors. I am one of those professors, but I am here to moderate and not to advocate in any way. So, but as full disclosure and full. Just 118. <laughs> 118, sorry. That's right. You're right. Um, and, and full disclosure, Dave and I used to play basketball together. <laughs> so, um, okay, um, so what this case involves is the intersection between antitrust and, and patent law um, because the two policies seem to point in different directions. The goal of antitrust law in general is to promote competition and to prohibit certain acts that would undermine competition. 
but the patent law views competition as problematic with, and, and that we need a, a break from competition in order to allow the patent owner to realize the benefits of their investments in innovation. And the question here is in the pharmaceutical industry context, whether the patent policy or the antitrust policy should predominate in a situation in which a, a patent-owning pharmaceutical company enters into litigation with a generic company that asserts that the patent is invalid. The generic company seeks regulatory approval to go to market with a generic substitute for a patented drug. Um, and in the litigation, it, the litigation resolves when the parties settle the dispute and one of the terms of the settlement is that the patent-owning pharmaceutical company pays the generic company some sum of money in exchange for the generic's agreement not to enter the market for a period of years, which will, would not exceed the term of the patent. And under the antitrust laws, the question is what, what if any level of scrutiny should a federal court give to such a settlement agreement? Um, and, and there are a variety of tests that are in, in the air. One of the tests is called the scope of the patent. This is a very patent policy uh, focused view in which if the patent owner has a monopoly to sell this chemical compound to the public, then um, any settlement that preserves that as the status quo is within the scope of the patent and should be deemed to be lawful. It's just normal patent law in operation. On the other side, um, the Third Circuit adopted what's called quick look review, which is a highly skeptical form of antitrust review that suggests that in, it, it's not per se unlawful, but suggests that there better be a very good reason to rebut the presumption that this is unlawful. And then a more middle ground standard, which, uh, which sort of entered at least in the argument today in, in, in the minds of some of the justices, would be a rule of reason balancing test that would um, sum up the pro-competitive and anti-competitive effects of the agreement um, and, and subject it to scrutiny under those. those. But I am not an antitrust expert. I, I, I focus on intellectual property. So I'm going to ask Scott if he might pick up from that very general thumbnail sketch to maybe sketch in a little more about the antitrust frame uh, in which this case arises. And then I'm going to ask the respondents to tell us a little bit about their theory of the case and then pass the baton down. From there, but great. So uh, first, thanks for the opportunity to uh, come. Oh, and to can you speak yeah. into a mic? Do you have access to one? Uh, I think that's probably about as close as okay. I can get. All right. Is that good enough? That should be. So uh, first, thanks for the opportunity to join this uh, terrific panel. I think we had a really spirited argument this morning, and it's uh, fun to uh, get to uh, reprise some of that. Um, I just want to emphasize, uh, although I've done some work for the Federal Trade Commission in the past on pharmaceutical competition issues, and I used to lead the New York's Bureau, which filed a series of briefs in this case, I speak only for myself, uh, not on behalf of uh, any of those institutions who may well disagree with uh, some of what I'd, what I'd have to say. So to take a, just a brief step back, I want to think a little bit about uh, the usual dynamic in brand generic litigation and then talk about how settlements might interrupt that, because I think that's the, uh, ultimately the core of the uh, plaintiff's theory, the government's theory of the case here. So in a patent dispute between a brand name drug maker and a generic firm, you've got this uh, uh, sharply contesting wills about what should happen. As we just heard, the generic firm wants to come in just as soon as possible. They, sure, there's a patent, but the generic takes the view that the patent's no good. It's either invalid, right, improperly granted, or else really narrow and therefore subject to a non-infringement strategy where you invent around, the, invent around the patent. So the generic is arguing we should be allowed to come in just right away. And the brand is saying, well, wait, wait, we've got this patent that was duly issued by the patent office, and we think you should wait until patent expiration. And so they're fighting uh, about who should prevail. But as often happens, you can imagine a settlement. Uh, a lot of these cases do settle. A lot of them settle without the reverse payments that are at issue in, in this case, or alleged to be at issue in this case. And so you could imagine the kind of intermediate point between the two, not right away, as the generic would want, and not all the way out to patent expiration, some, some middle ground, let's say. So the concern is what happens if, in addition to fighting over 
a settlement driven by what you could get in the patent litigation all by itself without thinking about money. You, in addition, add some money. So the theory here is that you have a payment from the brand firm that's made in exchange for additional delay, delay beyond what you might have anticipated from a settlement that didn't have, uh, that didn't have such a payment in it. And so the concern here is that when you add a payment, you're breaking something important. What you're breaking is the alignment between the generic firm and the consumers. In ordinary litigation, the generic is trying to come in early, which is what you could anticipate. Consumers, at least consumers who want low prices now, right, would want. When you add a payment, the generic is better off and is willing to accept a later entry date, but consumers aren't in that equation. Consumers are not also receiving a payment to compensate for that later date. And so the government is alleging here that it is a subversion of the competitive process to make a payment that breaks that linkage between what the generic firm would ordinarily want if it weren't paid off and what consumers expect, which is as much early entry as possible. Great. So um, there are three respondents in this case, and each one uh, comes at the case with maybe common cause but a particular uh, take on it. So I thought I'd ask each of the counsel to tell us a little bit about who your client is, how you got here, and uh, what what you agree on and to the extent that you have differences in, in what you think the court should do, maybe help us understand those differences. Uh, well, I represent um, activists who uh, was formerly known as Watson Pharmaceuticals, and it's a, a generic company that uh, was the first filer for the uh, generic version of Androgel and um, litigated the patent case and settled in 2006 in September, and then um, the FTC investigation began, and uh, the FTC then sued my client with, along with the other um, defendants in January of 2009, and so we won in the district court, and then we won in the 11th Circuit, and that's how we got here today. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the 11th Circuit, um, the, the precedent mandates the application of this, uh, mandated the application of the scope of the patent rule, which, you know, we think is entirely consistent with Supreme Court precedent. And, uh, you know, it, 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 the scope of the patent rule is really an accommodation of three different areas of law. I mean, it's, it's antitrust law, it's patent law, but it also takes into account settlement principles, which, uh, you know, it's very important to allow companies to settle litigation and, and also to provide clear guidance to companies that are engaged in litigation. And so that's what we, we believe that the scope of the patent rule uh, does. And... Um, you know, we it, there's the 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 notion of the the government's presumption of illegality. You know, it's 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 based upon the idea that it's intuitively obvious that in every single case, the the um, a payment to the generic would delay entry. And we've cited in our brief a lot of um, reasons why that's not intuitively obvious. In, the, in, in fact, the government thought <laughs> so until a couple of years ago. So I think that that's um, pretty much the the basis for for our position. No, Rohit. So um, my name is Rohit Singla again. I represent Solve, which is now in um, part of AbbVie, which is a spinoff of Abbott Laboratories, a major drug pharmaceutical company, innovator, patentee pharmaceutical company. And uh, me and my firm, uh, we have been involved in a number of these cases, including the Valley Drug case, which was the first case in the circuit courts to adopt the scope of the patent test. And I think the way we come at it, and I'd like to respond for a second to Professor Hemphill, you know, the story he tells that, look, these are payments made by patentees to generics to buy them off. It is a very compelling story. And I think what you might ask is, if it were that simple, why is it that every circuit court until recently to think of, look at this issue, multiple panels of multiple circuit courts have come out the other way? Why is it that over a hundred years of Supreme Court precedent in this area have consistently adopted the scope of the patent test? It's not a rule of patent law. The scope of the patent test is a rule of antitrust law that goes back at least to 1908. So why is it? Why is it that that story, if it's true, that the courts are coming out the other way until very recently? And the reason is because the story is not true. I mean, it's a great story, but the FTC has 300 settlements that we filed. Every drug company since 2003 enters into one of these settlements, you have to file it with the FTC. And there are plaintiff's lawyers, like my friend, Mr. Sorensen, who bring cases over and over again. And so what's happening is public. It's not secret. And I would challenge them to, to find an example 
over 10 years, hundreds of settlements, where there is proof that somebody is being paid, generic is being bought off, and the patent is being protected by buying off generic competitors. It just hasn't happened. And the reason is, and there's a couple of reasons. I want to give you a couple of, of reasons that wouldn't be happening. So imagine that you are a branded company, and you have a generic challenger, and I think the theory is that the patent is weak or vulnerable or something. And so you go to the generic and you say, look, I'll pay you $100 million. Go away. But what's going to happen? I mean, antitrust law tries to target those anti-competitive conduct that will not be regulated by the market, that the market itself will not take care of. So will this conduct, if this really happens, what's the market going to do? Imagine if we paid some generic company $100 million to protect a weak patent. What's going to happen? There's going to be a line of generic companies with their hands out saying, look, we'll challenge the patent. It doesn't cost anything to challenge a patent as a generic drug company. Give us $100 million. Venture capital funds, hedge funds, all these people who invest, why invest in a high-tech company if you can invest in a generic, generic drug company that's just going to come forward, challenge a patent for almost nothing, hire a patent lawyer, and then the branded drug company is going to pay you all your profits that you could ever make. I mean, the, there's no way that branded drug companies can do this in the real world because the market will stop them. The, the second point I'd like to make, and I don't want to take too much time and allow other people to speak, is the story also ignores the fact that the patent might be valid and infringed. So, Mr. Hempel, Professor Hempel used to work for the State Attorneys General, New York State Attorney General. So there's a very famous case called Plavix, about a drug Plavix, which was one of the most successful drugs in history. One of the most successful blood thinner drugs in history. And what happened in that case? The branded and the generic company entered into a settlement agreement during the litigation. Generic said your patent's invalid, it's, you know, it's not infringed, we don't infringe it, it's not valid. They entered into a settlement with a reverse payment, right? Supposedly the reverse payment. And the state attorneys general nixed it. They said, no, you can't enter that settlement. That's illegal. And they vetoed it. And so what happened? The case went to litigation, went to trial. And who won? The patentee won. And the generic didn't get to come to market for many years. And in the settlement, the generic would have gotten to come to market early, before the patent expired. Consumers, it's estimated, lost $2.5 billion in lower-priced generics because state attorneys general, under this idea that these settlements are anti-competitive, nixed that settlement. So when you're thinking about this, you can't just assume that the, these are bad patents or something nefarious is going on. If something nefarious was going on, market forces would stop that. And in every one of these situations, you have to think about, like in our settlement, our settlement allows generic companies to come to market five years before the expiration of Andrew Gell's patent. Now, if the settlement is nixed and we had to go to litigation, it's very possible, I would say maybe likely, that the branded company would win. And there would be no generic competition until 2020, until five more years. So the, the idea that these settlements are anti-competitive, I mean, there's not any proof. And I, I would ask um, Professor Hempel or the other people on the other side of the table for some evidence before we adopt antitrust rules that there's actually something anti-competitive going on. All right, Brian. I represent uh, respondents, PAR Pharmaceuticals and Paddock Laboratories. And... Uh, we're similar to uh, Watson, now Octavius, in that we are the gener a generic company that filed a paragraph for certification, initially um, seeking market entry for a generic bioequivalent to uh, the brand name product and issue can, here. Can I ask you, we didn't really put that out on the table, so sure. could you explain that process a little bit so we could... Yeah, so th there's, a, um, there's a specific process by which generic uh, drugs can seek uh, to enter the market. Um, so when uh, typically a, um, a brand name drug will file uh, a new drug application, and that application requires them to submit uh, scientific studies to prove uh, the safety and efficacy of the, the new drug. Generics um, have um, a different process that they go through, which is called an accelerated new drug application process, whereby a generic drug manufacturer needs to establish that they are uh, the bioequivalent of uh, a branded drug, and then for branded drugs that have patents listed that might be infringed by a generic seeking to, to market a bioequivalent, uh, make one of various certifications. And the certification issue in this case is called a paragraph four certification, whereby um, both Actavis and, and our client, uh, Paddock Laboratories, certified that um, the um, patents protecting the brand name product of Solvay uh, were invalid and or not infringed. 
And uh, that certification itself is uh, an act of patent infringement by statute, which then allows um, the brand name company to immediately institute a patent infringement action against the generic um, paragraph four filers. Uh, and outside of this, this statutory context, which is a, called the Hatch-Waxman Act and the, the regulatory regime it establishes, um, typically um, a company would need to actually start selling product before they could be sued for infringement. Here in this context, they need only um, file the paragraph four certification. So that's sort of the regulatory backdrop for what happened here. So whenever I say we were the second filer, um, Watson, now Octavius, made sort of the first um, challenge to the patent for the, the drug at issue here, which was a, a testosterone replacement drug. And um, shortly thereafter, uh, our client filed their paragraph four certification saying that, uh, certifying that uh, we had a drug which is the bioequivalent of the brand name drug and that our drug did not infringe any of the brand name's patents and or those patents were invalid. Why are you in this case? What's, what's in it for you? Uh, so I represent the uh, nonprofit organization Knowledge Ecology International. And at KEI, we're, we work on um, a lot of IP issues, but one of the ones that we focus a lot on is access to medicines. Um, and specifically, access to affordable med medicines. We work both in developed and developing countries. And we've noticed that even in developed countries, there's often a problem with people being able to pay the high monopoly prices for drugs. Um, the, the drug at issue in this case involved a um, gel formulation of testosterone. Testosterone had been um, off patent for, for quite some time. So the, the patent at issue here concerned the specific formulation of the drug. Um, and you know our concern is that when you have these reverse payment um, settlement agreements, it provides an incentive for generics to settle the case which just delays the entry of generics into the market, which keeps prices artificially high. Um, I mean, the Congress created the Hatch-Waxman Act to create an incentive for generics to challenge weak patents and uh, enter the market sooner. They, they did that by providing a 180-day exclusivity period where basically if the generic filer wins the patent litigation, um, they enter into a 100 180-day duopoly with the branded pharmaceutical company. Um, I believe Mr. Stewart, counsel for the uh, solicitor general, um, with the solicitor general's office, noted today that during that 180-day duopoly, most of the time the generic will uh, price their product at between 80 and 85 percent of what the branded pharmaceutical price is. But after that 180-day period, the price of that drug drops down to a fraction of, of what that cost is. Um, in response to, to something that uh, Mr. Singla brought up on, you know, if, if you can't assume that these are just bad patents or there's something nefarious going on here, I think that the FTC report that 73% um, of, of uh, cases that, that actually go to the merits and that aren't settled, in 73% of those cases, the generics actually prevail. And I think that's very strong evidence um, that these payments are being being made to pay off these generic companies and keep them off the market um, because the branded pharmaceutical companies believe that, that these are weak patents, that the generics are challenging weak patents. Um, and Dave, if, if you, you know, and help us understand who enforces the antitrust laws because the government itself speaks with more than one voice and there were some realignments going on and then you fit into the mix how? Sure. Um, well, I'm at a, a private class action firm in Philadelphia and we basically oppose Rohit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we've been doing that for, I think, over 10 years now. Um, you should leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we represent uh, our firm direct purchasers, typically wholesalers, who buy uh, the brand drugs directly from uh, Mr. Singles' clients and others. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the direct purchaser rule, very quickly, Supreme Court precedent going back to the 60s and 70s held that for federal antitrust law, not state but federal, uh, only the first or direct purchasers can uh, sue and recover overcharges. So if the brand overcharges wholesalers, wholesalers can sue but retailers and then consumers down the line cannot, at least under federal antitrust law. So we represent wholesalers. So, so um, 
not to pick on you, Rohit, but Rohit's clients enter into these deals and keep the generic off, prices high. Uh, the FTC has brought a number of suits. We often also bring private lawsuits, as we did in this case, the one in front of the Supreme Court, seeking overcharges on behalf of wholesalers. Oftentimes, other uh, lawyers representing indirect purchasers of various types also bring suits. So it becomes a very large piece of litigation. In this particular one, the FTC challenged the agreement involving Angel. We filed a private lawsuit. We were all sent to um, Atlanta uh, in front of, of the district judge. The FTC suit was dismissed early on. Our survived a motion to dismiss. We litigated. We recently lost on summary judgment and are appealing. That appeal has been stayed pending a decision by, by the Supreme Court. Um, I can certainly pause, but I, I'm also happy to respond to several of Rohit's <laughs> points. Um, you know, he says, uh, where's the evidence uh, that these payments are, are keeping generics off? Well, first, you know, let, let's, let's take a step back and look at the money that is driving all of this behavior that is being talked about, right? It's all about money, as probably most of you already suspect. Um, brand company that's successful selling a billion-dollar drug, uh, by the time it's doing that, its profit margin is something like 80 or 90 percent. Uh, the generic could sell the product at a fraction of that and still make a profit. Uh, and so there's – and they will take the brand sales essentially immediately. Uh, nowadays, as soon as the generic comes on the market, pretty much the entire market switches from brand to generic. So both sides know what the stakes are. The brand knows that on a Friday, if come Monday there's a generic, its billion-dollar drug is gone. The generic knows the same thing. So without casting aspersions on anyone, the, there's a tremendous economic incentive uh, facing brand companies to keep generics off as long as they can. Uh, with, with, with large selling drugs, every day is, is, represents millions of dollars. So look at it that way. The idea that brands will pay generics to speed up generic entry is kind of ridiculous. They're paying them to, to push that date into the future as far as it, they, can, they can go. Uh, a couple of examples. Uh, well, first, the FTC has studied this question uh, and has uh, concluded that agreements that they do look at with these kind of payments are delaying the date of generic entry compared to settlements without it. And they've looked at many of these settlements. The Cipro case which I litigated, we ultimately lost in the Second Circuit, has, was an explicit agreement where Bayer, a uh, maker of Bayer aspirin and Cipro, antibiotic, entered an agreement in which they were paying the generics every, I think it was every quarter, choosing whether to pay them to stay off or let them on. And it kind of went on for years. And each time that decision came up, they kept paying them. So there was an explicit trade-off. We pay you, you stay off. We pay you, you stay off. And they just kept doing it. Uh, there's a, a case that I'm also litigating. Uh, it's currently stayed pending the Supreme Court in which a brand company paid off uh, four generic companies, not one, not two, not three, not but four. Um, and the patent in that case was held invalid and not infringed. Um, but they paid off four generics, which is also uh, an answer to the point that my colleague, Mr. Singla, made that well, you know, this, the, the market will take care of itself. Um, you know, if the brand pays off a generic, other generics will come running. And there may be a problem, but it won't last very long. Uh, I want to come back to that because there's some nuances to that. But at, at bottom, again, uh, the answer is that, that that's not what happens. Because after the first generic, generic prices drop so fast. When you have, the, when you have one generic on the market, you know, a dollar drug may sell for like 85 cents. And the profit margin is still high. It costs 10 cents to make. The brand was selling it for a buck. The generic by itself sells it for 85 cents. That's still a big profit margin. Multiple generics come on. That price goes rapidly down to 10 cents. That's, that's what happens. It happens again and again and again. So what does that mean? It means that a brand has enough profit to pay off not just one generic and not just two, but multiple generics, because the other generics' profit expectations are very low. They're not going to make much money anyway. And the brand says, what will it take? And they can pay off multiple generics. And that happens a number of times. In this case, the one in the Supreme Court, they paid off two. Uh, in Cador, 
The case that went up to the Supreme Court, cert was — is stayed pending this decision. I'm also involved in Cador. They paid off two. Provisional, they paid off four. So it's — it's not true that the market will self-correct because of the economics. And then there's some other problems with self-correct, which I'll — I'll get to. So let me — two things. So first, I want to thank — we were just joined by, in our case, Professor Bill Kolaski's antitrust class. So welcome, class. Bill's a partner at Wilmer Hale in — in town. And thank you for joining us. We've got some renowned antitrust law experts here, and we're — we're deep in the thick of it. They're relitigating the case with — and I'm going to — I'm going to let respondents — you choose someone to — I know you want to — you're chomping at the bit to respond. So you get one more chance to litigate the merits. And then I'm going to ask Scott to step back from this particular litigation of the case to now help us think about the way the justices are thinking about this case based on the evidence of today's argument, recognizing that argument is — you know, you have — there are tea leaves there that are hard to read. But respondents, who — who wants to — you know, the FTC is telling us these are weak patents, and — and there's — this is market segmentation that's not supposed to happen. What do you say? Well, you know, I just — it's Chris, I think, who mentioned the 73 percent number that comes up again and again and again. And every study that the FTC has done cites that number. And many other articles use that as their premise for why these settlements are anti-competitive. And that's the number where the FTC says, you know, in their study of 20 cases or 40 or whatever it was, that, you know, generics prevailed in 73 percent of ANDA litigations. And first of all, that number — another study, a more recent study done two years ago with — with at least 100, maybe 150 cases, came with — came in with a much lower number, showing that it's, you know, 48 percent — generics prevail in 48 percent of the cases. And so the numbers, you know, they're — they're certainly not as — as — as high as the — as the FTC makes them out to be. And — and the studies have been criticized. I mean, the FTC studies have certainly been criticized that are sort of this underpinning for the FTC's rule. Can I just respond to one more point? Sure. You know, one of the things that troubles me about the entire debate that's been going on for 15 years that we've been involved in on this issue is my feeling is that it's really driven by a — a — the fact that these are drugs. It's driven by the fact that we're talking about generic drugs, and there's a feeling out there that generic drugs should be more available because they're cheaper and it's about a public health issue. And I think what's getting lost in the debate is that generic drugs, lower-priced generic drugs, with all due respect to my colleagues here, are not necessarily a public good. We have a patent system for a reason. We have a patent system because we want companies to price drugs at a very high price. As a country, as a nation, we have made a decision, unlike many other countries, that we are going to allow companies to have patents on drugs so they can charge very expensive prices. Now, why do we do that? We do that so we — we encourage people to invest the billions, literally billions of dollars it takes to develop new drugs. The United States is the source of most new useful pharmaceuticals in the world. Why is that? Because we have one of the strongest patent systems, one of the greatest incentives for people to invest. So when we're talking about this, you can't just say, well, look, such and such rule will have more generic drugs. The goal is not just to get more generic drugs. The goal is to have a system that we — where we have investment in new innovative drugs that save lives, and at the same time to make generic drugs available when appropriate. So that's — I mean, we can go through all the statistics and whatever, but I just want to say that there's something being lost on the other side in this discussion. I mean, just one last point. You know, Mr. Sorensen mentioned the Cipro case, and there were payments in the Cipro case. There were very large payments. I think there was like $400 million in payments, or some number like that, from the brand company and the generic company. Oh, well, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? It sounds terrible. Until you learn that that patent was upheld by the PTO, it was upheld by three later courts who all said that patent is valid and infringed. The Federal Circuit went and then upheld that patent. Now, you tell me, if that is a valid patent on a very important — I think it's an antibiotic, if I remember — drug that saves lives, why is it so terrible for a company to do whatever it takes to preserve its profits that it can then use and invest in the next — next round of R&D? I think that gets very easily lost when we're just talking about the price of generic drugs relative to the price of branded drugs. That's not the issue. So let me — so one of the things that makes this a complicated case for the Court is its decision is not whether this particular payment is lawful or not. The legal question before the Court is what's the appropriate level of scrutiny that a Federal court should give when deciding whether to uphold the settlement or not. 
which antitrust level of review is appropriate. And one of the difficult questions is what we've heard is there's an underlying question about the patent's validity. So the patent law presumes that when the Patent and Trademark Office issues a patent that it's a valid patent. But that presumption is rebuttable. So a federal court on a showing of clear and convincing evidence can find the patent is invalid. So the parties were on their way to litigating that question of invalidity when they settled the dispute. Should that question of invalidity then reemerge in the antitrust analysis of that settlement is an issue lurking in the case. So, Scott, maybe help us understand, based on the precedents, what are the different roads the court might take? And you can take the first sort of whack at your reading of the courts. You wrote the argument this morning. Give us your sense of where the justices are lining up on this, if you can. Sure. So to take a step back, in a standard antitrust class, at least in my class, I teach either three or four different positions that you might take toward a horizontal restraint. Per se illegality, bid rigging, very simple price fixing, rule of reason. It's a horizontal restraint, but there's some good stuff, there's some bad stuff. Let's put plaintiffs to the trouble and expense and difficulty of establishing market power and anti-competitive effect, even before we get to the defendant's opportunity to explain why there is no there there. There's actually a pro-competitive justification. Now, in between, there's what I think at least most Hornbook antitrusters and probably most antitrust professors would describe as the quick look, which was explicitly identified in a case called California Dental that was talked about in the oral argument today, where you say, well, look, I don't know for sure if this is bid rigging exactly, but it looks pretty bad. And so I'm going to immediately push things to defendants, require them to say something nice about the justification, explain why it's pro-competitive, maybe advance some evidence, before then putting plaintiffs to the full test. Now, the government has suggested that because this smells pretty bad, they would say, we ought to adopt a quick look. And I think you saw it today in the oral argument. The justice is struggling over what the right frame is. I think most of the justices, perhaps all of them, had no trouble understanding the sort of division of monopoly profits difficulty here. I think what they were wrestling with was how would we actually implement this if we did take the path of showing liability here? Are we comfortable with the government's test? There was a lot of back and forth about whether this quick look approach was the right one. You had Justice Breyer saying, I don't know about this quick look or whether it even exists. Now, this is not entirely surprising. In California Dental, Justice Breyer dissented and didn't say, as far as I can recall, the words quick look anywhere in the opinion. And so his responses suggest that he's at least wrestling with the possibility that a more full-bodied rule of reason or something even in between. Some people would say that quick look isn't what I just said it was. But in fact, it's a kind of loosey-goosey, as Souter says explicitly, inquiry with an E, inquiry meet for the case, an inquiry meet for the case. And Breyer seemed at least potentially attracted to an approach where maybe you'd specify a set of justifications that would be available. Maybe you'd leave it to the district court, right? So the Supreme Court up on Olympus perhaps just presses a reset button and says, look, we don't agree with the scope of the patent. We're not willing to say that there's a presumption of illegality. You guys work it out for yourselves. You saw a lot of different possibilities, I think, this morning. So anyone else want to offer observations about which, you know, predictions or observations? I don't have any predictions at all. But, you know, one question I'd have for Professor Hempel, because I've been trying to struggle with this for a decade, and is I understand people's concerns about the scope of the patent test. I do. I understand why people have hesitation with it. But what I don't understand is what the alternative is. Like, what is this rule of reason test? What would the test be? And I think Justice Breyer was struggling with that. I think Justice Kennedy was struggling with that. What would this test be if it doesn't require you to actually go out and figure out what happened with the patent? For example, let's take Cipro. You want to, David, raise that. Mr. Sorensen, raise that. I mean, if you're looking at that before there's a judgment on the patent, and you're trying to figure out whether it's anti-competitive or not anti-competitive, don't you have to know 
whether the patent's valid and infringed, because the patent's valid and infringed, how could you say it was anti-competitive? So I'm just curious what you think might be, uh, what is the middle ground yes. that could work? Right. So I think I'm with the FTC on this, right, that fundamentally we're talking about a disruption of the process, and that that's a disruption that occurs whether the patent is strong or weak. So just, I just want to make clear how much I disagree with your presentation. Of how, <laughs> <laughs> In case you were wondering. Not, not only the right answer, but also of how the FTC conceptualizes the case. The FTC does not conceptualize this as a case that depends upon the weaknesses of the patents that are being litigated. And so Cipro is counterexample, or Plavix is, ca Plavix is a funny counterexample that we can get into. They're not interested in that. For strong patents or for weak patents, paying to kind of top up your right is thought to be problematic. Now, if you do care about the strength of the patent, though, uh, if you do care about whether it's strong patents or weak patents that are being litigated, I think we do have some evidence about that. And it's that settlements with reverse payments are mostly on secondary patents. And I just want to I just want to put in a plug for some work since it hasn't been mentioned in earlier work. I'd love to mention it. I'd love to mention oh, it. We have, we have a paper, <laughs> uh, a co-author and I have a, have a paper that was published in Science last week, basically making two simple points. That settlements with reverse payments are mostly on patents, not always, but mostly, nearly 90%, on patents that are called secondary patents. These are patents not on the active ingredient but on some ancillary aspect like a formulation. The second point is that if you look at several hundred litigated patents uh, over a period over the last decade and code them patent by patent, litigation outcome and patent type, you find more or less what you'd expect that of the cases that litigate to conclusion, if you've got an active ingredient patent and you're, and you're a brand, you're probably going to win almost always. And if it's a patent on one of these secondary aspects, you're probably going to lose. Not always. Not always. There, there, there are no certainties in this business. You're probably going to lose. So if you do care about patent strength, then I think there is strong evidence that most of the drugs on which we are seeing these reverse payment settlements are on these secondary aspects, which has an implication for your point about innovation. As to innovation, it means, look, if it is the patents that are weaker, the secondary patents in general, that are getting topped up through these reverse payment settlements, then, I mean, I take the innovation point is that we should tolerate reverse payments because they increase profits and therefore provide additional incentives for innovation. Those incentives are by and large accruing to those secondary innovations. And particularly in this day and age where we have kind of a crisis in pharmaceutical R&D because we're not getting as many new chemical entities as we'd like, I think we've got to be particularly concerned about this selective subsidy that distorts innovation away from the stuff that we perhaps primarily care about and toward these secondary innovations. Or at least that's the, that's the argument that you have to defend, not some subsidy to innovation generally. Happy to defend it. Um, can I... Jump in here. All right. Why don't we double up on them? And make sure. <laughs> um, where, 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 where do I start? Um, you know, in terms of the, the patent system, uh, Roe was talking about you know strong patents. If you have a strong patent, um, it's a lot cheaper to litigate that, get an injunction, and keep the generic off the market than to pay them. I mean, it is much cheaper. You don't need to give them these reverse payments to keep the generic off. Just beat them. The litigation costs are a fraction of what these companies are spending to buy off the generics. Uh, so that's one, one response. Um, and then, of course, there's a whole area of infringement, which um, came up uh, this morning. Uh, I think Justice Sotomayor raised it with Jeff Weimerger arguing for, for the respondents. Well, there's a statutory presumption of validity which can be rebutted. There's no statutory presumption of infringement. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, there's never a pre presumption of infringement, and the patent holder always has to prove it. And, of course, if you think about a patent as a, as a circle, if you don't infringe, you're outside that circle. You're outside any s scope of that patent. And yet, um, according to uh, the respondent's position, if the brand can make a good faith allegation that you're inside the circle, it's not sham, that's it. As soon as it's not sham, the brand is now free to 
pay the generic as much as it feels like, $10 million, $100 million, $400 million, there is no limit to keep the generic off as long as it wants to up until the patent expires. And in terms of the justice struggling with, you know, different positions, I think a very, I'll try to make this very quick, history of where the different appellate courts were is instructive. The first appellate decision to look at this issue was the Sixth Circuit in Cardism. I know them by their drug name. Held it per se legal. They took a look at this kind of agreement and said, ha, that is per se legal. Within just a few months, the Eleventh Circuit came out with Valley Drug and said, well, we're not so sure about that. You've got to look at the patent, see what the patent is doing. There was a lot of dispute and debate about what the Eleventh Circuit meant when it issued that opinion. I was involved in litigating it on remand. We actually looked at the patent. We briefed back in the district court that this patent was a loser. The district court adopted that analysis, and we won in the district court. I think that's the only district court that's done it that way. Then these cases kept going, and then you get the Second Circuit, Tamoxifen, which actually adopted the scope of the patent test as it's kind of known today. That was the first case that actually did that. Before that, it was a big debate about what the Eleventh Circuit actually had done. So then you get Tamoxifen, which said there is a problem. These payments are probably causing problems, but the market will self-correct. Other generics will come running, which I think is false, but that's what they said. And then you kept going, and then you get the Third Circuit and Cador kind of going back to the beginning and saying, whoa, this is anti-competitive. We won't make it per se. We'll go quick look. So, you know, it's kind of been bouncing around. And one of the questions that Rowett raised, it's a fair question, and I've asked it myself. I've said to myself, how can we lose these cases? You know, I'm curious. I mean, good lawyers on the other side. No, certainly that is part of it. I mean, I've walked out of, you know, summary judgment hearings like in Cipro on a snowy day in Brooklyn. I thought we were going to lose. I was like, how is this happening? I mean, it seems to me so obvious that this is a problem, and yet we're losing, at least, you know, sometimes. And I do think that from what I can tell from arguments and what I've heard and what I've read, that part of the problem is there is a reluctance, more than a reluctance, on behalf of many judges to go back into patent merits. They don't want to do it. You know, in fact, I've heard people say judges hate patent cases, and when they settle, they have a party. I mean, it's great because, you know, they're not chemists. They didn't major in chemistry in college and what have you, and patent cases are difficult and technical. And so, you know, the idea that private plaintiffs or the government is going to bring this patent case back into their courtroom, they just, you know, they're kind of aghast. So, you know, I do think that's part of it. I think there is a real reluctance on judges to have that thrown back at them. And I think this morning there was a debate, you know, I think going on about the role of the patent merits. If the court comes out in some kind of a rule of reason analysis, rejects the Eleventh Circuit and scope of the patent, doesn't go all the way to the government's position, and goes for some kind of rule of reason, I think one of the key debates they're going to have is what role the patent merits plays in that analysis. What do you do with them? Do you reintroduce it back into the antitrust analysis in some fashion? The government at one point took that position. Or do you keep them out and look at other things? There's a kind of theoretical notion that if you look at the patent merits, you're actually going to get at whether these agreements are anti-competitive or not. That's one school of thought, which would suggest that you do it. On the other hand, I think there's a general sense that that imposes burdens on the parties, on the court. It does. I don't think it's impossible. I think it beats the scope of the patent. But I acknowledge that it creates certain, you know, challenges. And so I think that's a debate that we're going to see. Well, we won't see it. It will be inside the Supreme Court. We may see the result of that debate in, you know, in the opinion. And then one quick thing. I want to talk about Cipro very quickly. I think it's illustrative. Rode is right. In Cipro, the brand paid $400 million. $400 million. And Rode is right that after that, Bayer upheld its patent. But what he's leaving out. Three times. What he's leaving out is that the first generic that was paid $400 million, the argument that they were presenting, were ready to go to trial on inequitable conduct, has never been examined by any court. The subsequent generics never went back to that point. They didn't have the time. The patent life was running. And what the first generic, the challenge that they presented, has never been looked at by any court. And as part of the settlement, Bayer made sure that the lawyers for the generic could not represent any other generic. 
As part of the settlement, which I always found very unusual, they made sure that the generic lawyers would represent Bayer, and so they couldn't represent any other generic. Now, I don't know about you, that is not the sign of a, of a confident patent holder. Um, so, anyway, I'll stop. So, so I, I think what we see here in this discussion is a lack of understanding, from my perspective, from my perspective, of patents. I'm a patent lawyer and I'm an antitrust lawyer, and I think often people who talk about this who don't know patent law and don't understand the patent system. So, for example, there's this comment that you hear a lot, well, there's no presumption of infringement. So if there's an infringement dispute, why should we, as antitrust lawyers, as antitrust law, why should we defer to the reasonable assertion of an infringement claim? There's no statutory presumption of infringement the way we have a statutory presumption of invalidity, or excuse me, of validity in the patent law. Okay, there is a presumption of infringement. There is absolutely a presumption of infringement deeply embedded in the patent regime. Antitrust law does not examine a patent-related restraint. And this goes back to Standard Oil to the 1930s and has consistently been held by the Supreme Court ever since. Antitrust law does not look at a patent-related restraint and ask, well, was there really infringement or not? It assumes infringement. And it has to. Just think about it for a minute. Just think about it for a minute. You're a patentee. You see your competitor on the market with a product. Infringes your patent. Right? You go to them. You say, hey, you've got to take a license. I have a patent. You have to take a license. Pardon me. And, and they say, no, no, I don't infringe your patent. And we negotiate, and we enter into a license. Right? This happens every day, hundreds of times a day throughout the economy in every industry. Every day, right? This is what patent lawyers do. We negotiate a license. Okay, you're going to pay me 5%, and you're going to exit after three years. Or you're going to pay me 5%, and you only get to market to doctors and not to hospitals. This happens all the time, every day. Now, when we enter into that license agreement, no antitrust court is going to go back and say, well, wait a minute, did she really infringe your product? And if she didn't infringe your product, then now you violated the antitrust laws. If that's the way we ran antitrust law, you couldn't have patent licenses. The entire technology economy, my state of California, it would all fall apart, right? You can't have a license regime where every time you enter into a patent license that restricts to a market, restricts to a time period, restricts to a product, which is all part of our patent rights, you can't do it unless someone proves first that there's an infringement or proves first there's validity. You have the antitrust law. It's not a coincidence that DOS, I mean, I don't want to name a lot of cases, that these Supreme Court cases presume infringement and validity when they're doing an antitrust analysis. You have to. There's no other way the regime will work. The second point. I could do lots of points, but I want to give other people a turn. The second point. You'll notice a lot of the discussion starts to turn on, well, these pharmaceutical patents are BS. Uh, to pardon my French, but these pharmaceutical patents are not worth it. They're secondary patents. They're not, they're not strong. Professor Hemp has an article that I've read very carefully and I've looked at his data that, oh, well, these are all secondary patents, so therefore they're weak. Now, what has happened in that line of logic? They're secondary patents, therefore they're weak. Where does that come from? That is not a concept in patent law. The patent statute, the patent statute says you can get a patent over an invention or an improvement. And we make no distinction in patent law between inventions and improvements. And the reason is there's no difference. There's no difference between inventions and improvements. How many of the most valuable patents and products out there today are improvements, secondary patents? Uh, Prilosec. You all know Prilosec? Very important drug. That's a secondary patent. Androgel. Someone was just saying testosterone has long been off patent. Testosterone is known to have a positive medical effect since, I think, the 30s. Androgel came to market in 2000 and immediately became a four or $500 million product. Why? Why? If secondary patents are not valuable, and androgel is a secondary formulation patent, testosterone, as they're saying, has been on the market or has been known to have a medical effect for 70 years, why is androgel a $400 million product? Because the secondary formulation was the first time anybody had been able to take testosterone, put it in a, in a product that you could squirt on your skin and use, and you would not get an overdose. It was the first time someone would be able to take testosterone and make it useful to people in a, in, a, in a formulation you could rub onto your skin. Is that's not valuable? Just because it's a secondary patent doesn't mean it's not valuable. So I, I just think that when, you're, when we're looking at this, you can't fall into the traps of, oh, well, these are secondary patents. Oh, well, these patents are not useful. Oh, these patents are not as good as those patents over there. That's not the way either our antitrust system or our patent system works. Great. So I'm going to let... Um Ryan, Krista, and Julia uh, get a word in edgewise. Uh, and, and ideally, give us anything you can share about your 
it, it looks to me like the justices are coming at this from multiple ang- testing. There's a lot of testing of different theories. Justice Breyer seems to be looking at one way of resolving the case. Justice Kennedy seemed very, very concerned that Justice Breyer was not as interested in the strength of the patent. Uh, Justice Kennedy, in some other opinions, has started to express some concerns about the the patent system, that it works in some areas but doesn't work in others and maybe wants to see that part of the analysis. So you heard lots of different angles going on, and I'd just be interested in any observations you might be willing to share about sort of where you think the court is and what what challenges they would have in writing this opinion, however they might come out. Well, I, you know, I, I just wanted to follow up actually on a point that David Sorensen made, and that's, you know, the, the idea that the, the circuit courts have been bouncing around. And actually, I, I, I would disagree with that because I think um, the Solicitor General, in a couple of briefs to the Supreme Court, had taken the position that there was no split, that, there, that, the, that, that cardism was consistent with the scope of the patent rule because there were restraints uh, beyond the scope of the patent. They were bottlenecking, using the 180-day exclusivity to block other entrants. Um, and, and so that, in that sense, it was totally consistent with the scope of the patent rule. And, you know, I think that, you know, the, 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 the real question is how do you fashion any rule without going to a relitigation of the patent merits? And I think the 11th Circuit very colorfully called it the Turducken task. Um, I think it's the only <laughs> appellate opinion that's called anything Turducken, but it's very illustrative because it's it's the uh, patent inquiry wrapped inside the antitrust inquiry wrapped you know d- that's taking place many years later, and uh, you know that, that all all roads lead to the Turducken. To borrow one of my <laughs> co-counsel's descriptions, it's it's true. I think that there's no way around it. Any any interim test will require the court to relitigate the patent merits, and I think that. You know, that is something that, that the court is grappling with. Uh, just a couple of observations about the court and to echo some, some points that were already made. I think the court was very skeptical of the FTC's position. Um, as was mentioned previously, I think the court questioned um, the existence of a quick-look approach at all. And then also was skeptical because, um, to borrow some the, the strong and weak characterization of patents, um, it, it offers the same level of protection to, to patents that are very strong and those that are very weak. Um, and with respect to the scope of the patent approach, um, I think Rohit's right to say it's well established, and not only in this context, but in multiple contexts. And when pressed, um, the government was unable to identify a single case in which um, the court had invalidated conduct that was within the scope of the patent. And uh, in terms of some intermediary position, um, I think the court also, although it was grappling with what the formulation of that uh, position would be, what that test would look like, it was also observed that um, that any such test necessarily would require some evaluation of the strength of the underlying patent, lest the court, um, the district court trying to impl- employ that test, you know, be dealing with only say 20% of the factors as opposed to 80%, which, uh, as the court described, is really the core of the question, which is the strength of the patent. And I just wanted to follow that up. Um, and, 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 you know, it's a, a point that I think it's that, that um, Deputy Solicitor General Stewart closed with. He said that I think nobody wants the relitigation, <laughs> at least not the government and, and the respondents. Um, his, his closing line was that everybody recognizes that it just isn't feasible to try the patent suit. Uh, and, you know, I think that no brief um, from any side um, really advocated any type of test that would require that. So. All right. Krista, do you have? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I would agree that a lot of the justices did have concerns about the uh, strength of the patent. You know, Justice Kennedy said, well, I think it's, it's a problem if you just completely ignore the strength of, of the patent. I think Justice Scalia agreed with that, called it, you know, ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, I, I mean, I do, I do wonder, even though, um, you know, the, the FTC and the respondents and the Amici did not advocate looking at the strength of the patent, there was a lot of discussion and interest in that. So I do wonder if um, the justices might think of that as, as, um, as the correct avenue to go down. Um, but I, I also wanted to respond to some of the points that Mr. Singla made that um, Professor Hemphill also uh, followed up on. But I, I, I think that, you know, coming from an organization that advocates for public health and um, also for consumers, I, I think it's a mistake to say that we want companies to price 
their um, drugs very high. What we want, what the Constitution provides, is an incentive uh, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. But when we're talking about weak patents, um, and Mr. Singlet, of course, disagrees with me on, on, on what um, weak patents are, I, I do think that secondary patents are often weak. Um, I'm not necessarily disputing whether they, they may be useful or not. Um, I, I think that arguments can be made that sometimes they're not when you turn a gel tablet into a, um, uh, into a gel capsule into a tablet. That, that may be useful in, in some circumstances. It makes it heat stable. But in, in, in the context of, uh, of where we live now, that, that might not necessarily be useful. I, I think it's a debate on, on whether all secondary patents are useful or not. Um, but I think that many secondary patents are knocked out for being weak on the grounds of being uh, failing the non-obvious or novelty requirements. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think it's true that secondary patents are, are strong patents or that it's a mistake to point out the fact that, that the um, patents that generics are often challenging are secondary patents. Um, I think this all does go to the innovation point that, that he brought um, that he brought up earlier, and I agree with Professor Hemphill that what the secondary patents go to are not new chemical entities, they are not new drugs, um, they, are, they are often me too drugs, they are new formulations, um, new, um, new dosing, and they are not necessarily something that is a brand new invention, a brand new innovation that we really want to um, support their being able to keep that monopoly. If, if I can, I'd like to invite the audience to maybe, we have a, a distinguished panel here with some uh, clearly strong views, and they could obviously keep going at it. <laughs> uh, but if, if, there, if people want to hear from them about any particular issues in the case or about uh, sort of where, uh, I mean, maybe if I can ask one while people, and we don't have a floor mic, so you'll just have to stand and uh, all right, so I've got a question up in the back. Just speak loudly for the... Not a problem. Um, so I have a point and a question. My, my point is uh, that I, I think that part of the reason that the trend uh, away from innovation has been happening is actually because other than certain specific patents expiring, there's been a lot of um, innovator entrance into the generic market. So a lot of innovators themselves have been trying to fight other companies with their own version of generics, and they already have the production capacity, and they already have the ability and the know-how to do so. And that's been happening more and more, particularly in the, in the biofarm uh, biologics arena, because it's a much more complicated and um, much more intense uh, process of making it uh, than it is for a, a simple um, single molecule drug. So. Um, I just would, would want you to uh, maybe comment on that, whether or not, I mean, these these app, these disputes are open to both parties. So another um, uh, another innovator can bring a similar type of dispute. So when we say generics versus innovators, it, it, there's nothing limiting it to generics fighting innovators on these. These can also be between innovators. These can be between generics who are getting involved in the innovator market. So that's just... Um, that's just, um, I was wondering if you could comment on that, sorry. So, well, I'll, I'll take a piece of that, I, I, and I hope this is responsive. I, I do think there was some debate this morning about whether, uh, whatever rule the justices adopt, whether it's a rule for Hatch-Waxman cases, mm -hmm. um, or it's a rule of more general application to all patent cases. Um, I think there was some discussion of that. I think that part of what seemed to be relevant to some of the justices is that outside of Hatch-Waxman, these kinds of things don't happen, uh, that there's very little evidence that these kinds of reverse payments ever happen, and that they're different than licenses that, that Rohit was talking about, because in a classic license, uh, where there's no payment, you know, you're using the, the, the licensee is using its challenge as leverage to get the best terms, right? It can't make money unless it sells. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's using its leverage to get the best license terms that it can, whether low royalty, early entry, some combination. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's different than what's going on in these cases. And I think Scott's point that the government was trying to focus the justice on the process, and what's happening in this process when you introduce payments, you know, the generic without a payment is aligned with consumers, right? They make money um, entering the market, 
and that helps consumers. It's not because they want to help consumers per se. It's not – they're not altruistic in that sense. But by helping themselves, they help consumers. And the government's point is that you introduce a payment rather than use the leverage to get the best terms, early entry, low royalty. They use it to get paid. And it, it destroys that alignment. And, and that whole process gets, in effect, corrupted. Um, I think that's, you know, and, and – and, uh, but, you know, in terms of whether it goes outside Hatch-Waxman, I think part of your question is this is – may decide that – that it's just a problem in Hatch-Waxman, and so they will address it and say this is, seems to be a Hatch-Waxman problem. Or they may feel they need to say something about, well, if it happens in other areas, our rule would apply in those other areas, you know, outside Hatch-Waxman. Non-drug products or two innovators going after each other or, you know, what have you. Let's so see. correct me if I'm wrong. I may be wrong. But if uh, a competitor innovator company doesn't have a patent on something, but they want to market a generic version of it, they can also bring a Hatch-Waxman uh, paragraph 4 action against the innovator, correct? I'm not quite following you. I mean, any, any company that has the FDA approvals and, you know, can do this, can – you don't have to just be a pure generic company. You can be a brand company that wants to start that's selling generics. That's what I'm getting at. So if that's, if that's true, then um, I just think semantically it's not really necessarily a debate between generics and innovators. It's a debate between innovators who have a patent and people who want to get around that patent in a way. I mean, that's just the way it is. And that can be innovator companies. So I just sure. think that's a point to make. Sure. I don't know. Are there other questions? Bill? Uh, um, a couple of very general questions, I guess. Um, the first one is um, the purpose of the antitrust laws, obviously, is to uh, protect the free market. And um, couldn't one characterize what's going on in these cases as basically creating a free market in which the negotiations over the size of the payment uh, are a negotiation between two people at arm's length in which they are deciding whether the, part, the patent is strong or weak. If it's a strong patent, then um, it will require a smaller payment. If it's a large, a weak patent, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Um, and so um, our, isn't what's really going on here the question of whether we're going to let the market determine the strength or weakness of the patent, or whether we're going to have the courts determine. So, you know, I, there's a, your question raises a lot of different issues. I think it's a very interesting question. You know, one thing that I would, my first response would be, there is an assumption that is in the entire discussion that the weaker the patent, the larger the payment. I mean, I bet most people in the audience have this idea that the weaker the patent, the more likely you are to have a reverse payment, and the larger it's going to be. And I will tell you, I think, I mean, I see you're saying no, but I think most people have that idea. And I will tell you, I've settled. I do these cases. That's not true. The truth, the truth, that's not in the record and the briefs and in the article. The truth is the opposite. The truth is what very often happens is that you sit down to negotiate with a generic company. And so it's not exactly like, I don't think really analogous to a market kind of transaction. And you say to the generic company, look, my patent's got 15 years left on it, 18 years left on it, and I think I got 50-50 shot of winning. The generic says, oh, yeah, okay, 50-50 shot of winning. you got 18 years left. Now, what does that suggest the right split answer should be? Be like nine or ten years out, you're going to be able to enter. Right? That's what you think from that, right, if you take the, this sort of theory that you're being posited. And what you find, I think, very often is that generics will say, Look, that may be the, the fair result here, re reflecting the strength of the patent, the value of the patent, whatever our likelihood, but I ain't doing that. I'm a little company, and I got shareholders, and my CEO wants a bonus, and uh, we don't got any products in the pipeline, and I'd rather just roll the dice on my 50-50 um, than take a nine years out, and I'm not going to do that. And, you know, I, I think that it's just as plausible, and from personal experience I would say more plausible, that the reason you have reverse payments is actually because patents are really strong and the generics don't want to accept waiting 10, 12, 15 years to come to market than the, what's being posited on the other side, which is, I think, just sort of the, 
I don't know, people jump to this conclusion that it's the weak patents that are leading to the, to the payment. I don't know if that's responsive exactly to what you're saying. Yeah, so, to respond. yeah so just to follow up. So <clears throat> my, my view here is that it's, it's not a market outcome. It's, it's, a, it's a particular kind of market failure where, sure, two parties can reach a mutually acceptable deal, but one that, because it has these external effects, or there's an externality here with respect to consumers, there's a, there's a loss. I don't, know, I don't know if you made it to argument, but uh, there's, there's a really nice moment, and it happens to be a 50-50 kind of example, so I'm, Just I'm here to talk about it. Uh, I'm actually think, uh, Kagan's is nice, and she has an example, but I'm actually thinking of the one at the very end in, uh, in rebuttal. It was, sort of, it was uh, Malcolm Stewart's closing point. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, I'd say that our system encourages settlement, but not to the nth degree. And so, for instance, if you had two firms fighting over a million dollars, and each firm decided internally 600000 is the list I'll, ac I'll accept. If they stuck to their guns, the case couldn't be settled. Now, if the public could be made to kick in an additional 200000 then each of the firms would get its six hundred k and walk away content. But we don't pursue the policy in favor of settlement to that degree, and that's essentially what's happening here. That because there's this external effect that we have to worry about, that's why this is heartland antitrust. Okay. Yeah, so um, to what degree do you think that the fact that this case revolves around pharmaceuticals and, in fact, lower price generic pharmaceuticals for consumers is, um, is motivating to either the agency and or the courts, right? I mean, lots of patent cases settle. And if this were the semiconductor industry, I, I can certainly see situations where Patents have, you know, varying levels of uh, likelihood of uh, survival of validity challenges, and that, uh, you know, the, the likely expectation value of survival factors into what a settlement payment is going to be. And one party always pays the other party off. Um, in fact, they usually have dueling portfolios, and uh, somebody makes a net payment to the other. But, but the regulatory officials, at least, you know, and those have, don't seem to care all that much. And I know that. The Amici probably wouldn't be involved if this were just another case between Intel and Cyprus. So to what degree, I guess my question is really, what degree do you think the fact that this is a pharmaceutical case makes it unique? And how, how, what kind of lessons could we take away to other industries where there are big patent settlements? Are you a patent lawyer? <laughs> um, I teach patent lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> because... because my own personal view, and I, sa I said this a little earlier, is that this case is really all about the fact that we're talking about pharmaceuticals. If we were talking about any other product, I don't think we would be here today. Which I guess in some ways is good for me because I wouldn't have gotten, a, you know, we wouldn't have gotten the case in the Supreme Court. But because, you know, what, what, what you hear from the government and from the plaintiff's lawyers, look, reverse payments, it's only, it's only in these hatch vaccines. Unknown outside hatch vaccines. But I think if you're practicing patent law, that doesn't make any sense. Right? I mean, just the, the examples you're positing, you have a product and we have a patent dispute and we enter into a settlement in which we decide that, you know what, you're going to only market it in um, cell phones and you're not going to be able to market your chip for computers. That's an exclusive market territory allocation. And those settlements will have reverse payments to the same extent. The royalty rate will be lower or higher depending on the level of exclusion you get. You might have a settlement where you say, you know what, you're going to exit after two years and you're going to pay me this much money. But if you exit immediately, I'll let you pay me less. Now, that's the same kind of reverse payment that we're talking about. I mean, one thing I would just like to, to say, and I don't think there's a dispute really, is that when we're talking about reverse payments here, we're not just talking about, I mean, on the briefs talk about gold bullion or bags of cash. That's not what we're usually talking about. We're usually talking about a business transaction that the government is alleging is not sort of, sort of a secret subsidy to the generics. And that can be a, where the payment is the other way. A reverse payment under their way of looking at things would include, let's say, we settle a Hatch-Waxman case, and you're going to pay me a royalty. You're actually going to pay me a royalty as the brand company as part of the settlement. But the government of the plaintiffs will say, well, the royalty rate was too low. And so through the too low royalty rate, I've made a reverse payment because I've subsidized somehow, transferred part of the monopoly value. That's what that includes. That's in the definition of reverse payment, and that's that. I mean, your semiconductor example is going to have that, right? Every license, every settlement is going to have. If this is the law, you're going to be able to make accusations. I mean, Mr. Sorensen and his uh, colleagues will have a field day because you can go to 
Any patent settlement say, wait a minute, your royalty rate was too low. Wait a minute, your, um, the amount of marketing assistance you're giving is too high. You know, you can always find a reverse payment. I think there's something very special here in the, in the drug context. And I think this is something that both Justice Sotomayor and Justice Kagan picked up on at different points. Um, when a brand does a reverse payment deal with a generic, uh, particularly with the first filing generic, because most of these, not all of them, most of them are with first filer generics, which has special meaning within Hatch-Waxman. Uh, they're, they're potentially buying off somebody who's very special. They're special in the sense that they have the 180-day incentive that was mentioned before. They were anointed, in a way, by Congress to go be a champion. And they're the one, I think we could agree, that will have the largest, not the only generic with any incentive, but the largest incentive. Now, sometimes, because of quirks in Hatch-Waxman, there are several of them, and in some cases, as in Provigil, several such first filers all get paid off. Right? That sometimes happens. Contrast all the other generic firms, the ones that were behind. They don't have the 180 days. And what's more, due to yet another quirk of Hatch-Waxman, if you settle, you retain eligibility for the 180 days. Now, that has an additional pernicious consequence, which was mentioned by, I believe it was Justice Kagan, which is that those later filers, should they claw their way up and be at the cusp of entry, well, at that point, the generic can, the settling generic, the first filing settling generic, can go ahead and walk into the market, assuming they've negotiated for that as they usually, as they usually do. Now, this is interesting, I think, because it helps explain why we would expect to see this to a particular degree here. I won't say never elsewhere, but to a particular degree here. It also provides a basis, and I think Justice Sotomayor picked up of this, on this in her, oral, in her oral argument responses, that if you wanted to craft a rule that was good for one industry only, if you wanted to tell a pharma-specific story and worry less about slippage into the rest of the, into the, rest of the economy, there are reasons, Hatch-Waxman-specific reasons, that would allow you to do that. I just have to respond. I'm sorry. I cannot control myself. I'm sorry. I'm too wound up in this. But so if I'm understanding correctly, we're going to have, for the first time in as far as I know, 100 years of antitrust law. I mean, I, I, would, I cannot think of a case where we're going to have a special antitrust rule for one industry. I don't think we've ever done that. The Supreme Court has, I don't think, ever done that. We're going to have a special rule. Why? We're going to have a special rule because supposedly after the first file, the other filers don't have as much of an incentive to challenge the patent. That's what we're hearing. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are facts on the ground? If you litigate these cases, there is not a significant drug, Cipro, Tamoxifen, Androgel, Plavix, you name it, where there's not a line of generics, 5, 10, 15 of these people, excuse me, these companies, <laughs> I, I have a certain perspective, these companies <laughs> who are trying to challenge your patent. And they're not all first filers. And when you settle with the first filer, they keep coming. They don't walk away. They don't go like, oh, well, we're a second filer. Forget it. We're going to go home. They don't go home. So whether they have less of an incentive or not, of course they have less of an incentive. All you should care about is do they have an incentive to challenge the patent? And the fact, the absolute positive, 100%, read the briefs, facts, is that they always come and challenge. There's no product where you pay the first filer and then the second filers all will, like, vanish. They all want to challenge the patent and get to market. Whether they have less to make or more to make, it doesn't really matter. They're still going to challenge the patent. All right. Well, we are we are about out. I I, I want to just ask one question though, and this is now from a sort of IP uh, within the IP academic literature. There there is this notion that patents are presumed valid, but we know that sometimes they're not, um, and it's very expensive to uh, challenge the validity of a patent. Um, and when you win that challenge, you actually create a public good because now everyone can enter the market. So there's a disincentive to provide that public good. And some scholars have called for what's called a patent bounty, that you, in fact, need to subsidize the challenger in order to take the risk. And Hatch-Waxman is the only place in the patent law I'm aware of that embodies this theory of a patent bounty. Um, and so one... From that, from that perspective, that scholarly perspective, one of the issues with these settlements is that they undermine the government's bounty scheme. So I wonder whether, uh, is that a valid concern, or if not, why not? I think it is a valid concern. I mean, one of the uh, purposes of Hatch-Waxman was precisely to encourage generics 
to go look at brand patent portfolios and find the ones that were weak and then around them to not infringe, but also invalidate the ones that are, that are invalid. Um, it was designed for that. I mean, among the things that are in it, that the brand can keep a generic off the market for 30 months just by suing it, but only 30 months, meaning after that time is up, the generic just is, once it gets FDA approval, it can make its own business decision whether to launch, even though the patent litigation is continuing. Uh, there was not a rule that says, no, 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 you have to wait until the patent litigation is over, or you can't, no, the opposite, you can actually launch. The 180 day is an enormous financial incentive. Uh, it, it is hard, I mean, some generic companies say that without, you know, that's like where they get most of their profits, because they undersell the brand by a bit and still make an enormous profit margin. They can still make money down the road, but it's nothing like that 180 days. And the incentive is to challenge patents, invalidate them, or, or invent around them. And, you know, the, the, the point is, as, 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 as I think the justice got, is that with these payments, you just destroy that. I mean, you, you take that incentive and you flip it, and now the brand is just paying them off. So uh, just in response, I, I think I just said this. The, I, I, I hear that concern. I think it's a very legitimate concern that there's this bounty being paid in the Hatch-Waxman system and the settlement eliminates the bounty, or the bounty hunter, I guess. Um, but I think that ultimately the real question is, even if the first filer is settles, paid off, whatever you want to use, is there someone there willing to challenge? That's the question, right? And the thing about it is that this industry, I think people often forget, you know, the, the people talk about this industry and with the difference in prices as if that's a reason to have a special antitrust rule. And I would say it's the opposite. I mean, real experience shows that, that you forget that there's something called automatic substitution laws. I don't know if you're all familiar with this. So when you have a generic drug, you know, when you have a generic drug, you don't got to market it. You don't need salespeople. You don't need advertising. You don't need nothing. Why? Because there are laws in 48 or 47 states that say when a doctor prescribes androgel, if there's a generic on the market, the pharmacist may or often has to substitute the generic. So there is built into the system. I'm not saying that there's not a more of an incentive for the, the first filer with the 108 days. But the reason that you see 10, 15 generic companies trying to challenge a patent, even though they're not the first filer, is because if they can get on market, okay, maybe they're not going to make 100 million that the first filer would make. They're still going to make a lot of money because all they got to do is make this product that doesn't cost very much to make, start selling it, and it, there's like an automa it's automatically being prescribed by doctors because the brand company's built a market for it. And so there is an existing bounty there, even if it's not as great. All you need is a bounty that's enough to make people challenge. It doesn't have to be the greatest bounty of all time, is kind of what I would say. And then one last thing is that, you know, if the real issue is that these patents are, like, invalid or 75% of them are invalid or they're worthless, even if we settle, brand companies settle, there are other ways to invalidate the patent. Anybody, knowledge ecology, Mr. Sorensen, Professor Hempel, they can go to the PTO and say, you know what? This patent is invalid. Put it in re-examination. So patent lawyers know there's a re-examination process. You can go to the PTO and say, this patent's not valid. Testosterone has been on the market for 70 years. And the P anybody can do that. Anybody. It doesn't cost that much. You just file some papers. And if it's really invalid, the PTO will look at it again. More than that, the FTC and the government. The government can come in. The Supreme Court held in gypsum, whatever that was, 30, 40 years ago. The government can come in and say, they could say it for our case. You know what? We think your androgel patent is invalid, and we're going to prove it. And if they did, then these settlements would be terminated. So it's not like there's no way to challenge these patents just because they're settlements. There's more generics coming down the road. The government can challenge. And frankly, for at least validity issues, anybody in the room can go file something with the PTO. You said at least for validity issues. For validity. Okay. So we're an educational institution, and I would say that an education was provided by these uh, wonderful uh, uh, participants, not only in the issue in this hard case uh, that the, the justices are clearly going to wrestle with, but also about uh, how highly skilled lawyers interact. And I, I want to, uh, you know, the sparring, but the professionalism is a, is a great uh, model for our students. So I want to uh, thank you for that. Thank you for spending time with us. Um, and I invite you to a reception. And thank everyone for coming and for Professor Kalaski for sharing uh, this with his class. So thank you all. Thank you.